Well, we're still finding seats. Um, it, it was hard finding somebody to come and talk and hoping that somebody would show up. And, and it's delightful to see such a terrific uh, group here. Please feel free to fill in. If you want to come up towards the front, you might see a reserved sign, but sit in it. We've reserved it for all of you that came late. So we've got, as I'm looking, there are enough seats towards the front for everyone that I see in this room. So please come in and fill in. Welcome to the 11th annual Howard R. Driggs Lecture held at Southern Utah University. This memorial lecture was established in 2009 by Dr. Driggs' stepdaughter, Camille Bradford, who is with us here today, along with other members of uh, Mr. Driggs' family and friends. And if we could, briefly, would you all stand up so that we can see the, the um, Driggs family? Dr. Howard R. Driggs served as one of the very first faculty members of Southern Utah University when it was known as Branch Normal School, 1897. He went on to teach at the University of Utah and New York University as a professor in English. During his distinguished career, Dr. Driggs was also a well-known historian and author of books on the pioneer trails and settlements in the West. And if you have a minute, you can stop into special collections in the library and, and see his room and do research there. This year, we are honored to have our Provost Bradley J. Cook with us as the Driggs presenter. During the same year that the Driggs lecture began, Dr. Cook joined Southern Utah University as its provost. He served in this capacity for 10 years. While at SUU, he has worked to establish this university as a national leader in student-centric, highly applied learning environments, and has advanced an ambitious agenda of internationalizing the university. Under his leadership, Southern Utah University created over 25 new academic programs and centers, and elevated SUU's academic reputation as one of the premier public regional universities in the Intermountain West. He comes today's topic having grown up in Saudi Arabia as a teenager. This proved to be a transformative and defining experience for him as he went on to get three academic degrees with specialties in Middle East studies, Arabic, and Islamic studies. His first job right out of college was at the American University in Cairo, after which he worked in Kuwait for two years immediately following the first Gulf War. Prior to his current position, he served as president of the Abu Dhabi Women's College in the United Arab Emirates, and eight years at then Utah Valley State College as vice president of college relations and then vice president of academic affairs. Dr. Cook has degrees from Stanford University and the University of Oxford. It is our great honor to welcome Dr. Cook to be this year's Driggs Lecture presenter. Thank you, President. And uh, Steve Benyon, who was sitting right behind me, also reminded me, and of this group, that I'm a graduate of Snow College. Can't forget that. This is truly a, a privilege and an honor to be a part of Founders Week. Um, I love our founding story. You know, there are some that kind of their eyes roll with our story of Old Sorrel. I'd never get enough of that story because I really do think institutions need to have those epic stories. And if you don't know our story of SUU, it is the most, uh, I think, unique story in, in higher education uh, in terms of its founding. And it's just such an honor to be a part of it and to be a part of the Howard R. Driggs Memorial Lecture. And by the way, it's so nice to see Camille and the, and the Driggs family. Thank you, the Christensen's. Um, I want to thank the, the Driggs Lecture Organizing Committee I mean, and it, it's, it's such an honor to be here because if, if you've been to this memorial lecture, 
before, there's some, there's some serious academics, you know, people like Joseph Ellis and Joshua Friedenberg and uh, Quintard Taylor. Um, so I still don't know what I'm doing here, but I've got, you, you've, you deserve to know the truth. And this is, this is what happened. I get this phone call from President Wyatt, and he said, I've got really some good news and I have some bad news. What do you want first? And I said, well, well, you know, give, me the, give me the good news. And he said, well, the good news, I want to say congratulations. You have been identified and selected as the 2019 Howard R. Driggs Memorial Lecturer. And I knew about these other people. And I just thought, I, I'm stunned. I'm, I'm honored. Uh, what, what's the bad news? And he pauses and he said, well, everybody turned us down or they're too expensive. <laughs> so if you're disappointed today, you can thank your cheap president. <laughs> I won't take it. I won't. Uh, um, how am I doing on technology here? I think it's this one here. So what do these two seemingly very different religious traditions have to do with each other? It turns out a lot, and I think a lot that most people don't know about. But before getting into the substance of this, I really feel uh, compelled, um, and I would be really remiss uh, not to mention my, my sadness, my deep sadness and horror of what happened last Friday in Christchurch, New Zealand, where uh, a gunman went into the Al Noor um, Mosque and the Linwood Mosque and indiscriminately slaughtered 50 innocent people. Um, this one um, hit particularly personal for me, and I'm surprised still at my reaction here, and probably because I've spent much of my life in the, in the Islamic world. Uh, I have deep friendships. I've studied the tradition and, and understand that this is happening more and more about people being identified because of their religious affiliation and being killed, whether it's Jews in a synagogue in Pittsburgh last year, uh, whether it was um, worshipers in a traditional black Baptist church in South Carolina a couple of years ago. But I need to remind this group um, that this ought to be personal for you too, many of you, if not most of you, because this history is our history. Um, about 180 uh, years ago, in 1838, there were a group of Mormon settlers, and they were in Caldwell County, Missouri, and they had started a homestead along Shoal Creek at a place called Hans Mill. About 50 families were there, and it was in October, early October, October 10th, about 4 p.m., when a similar thing happened where a group of men came in and began shooting indiscriminately with this group. Many of the women and children scattered throughout the woods and were hunted down. Many sort of retreated to the blacksmith shop, but it turned out the blacksmith shop ended up being a trap in a way because the way the structure was built, the slats between the logs were, there were several spaces, um, several inches between the logs, and this mob essentially just fired into the structure. 1,600 rounds is estimated that went in there and killed everybody, and those that weren't killed were killed execution style, um, including a 10-year-old boy. Um, this is personal to many of us because uh, that's our heritage too many of us in here. Um, and so my hope today is to do a couple of things. One is a greater sense and appreciation, an understanding of very two seemingly different religious traditions, that of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And I want to be sensitive to those that know that the recent sort of call uh, from church leadership is that's the official name, and I, re and I respect that, of course, but I hope that you might uh, indulge me on the shorthand 
of Mormon, given the historical sources we're looking at use that uh, term, the, of sort of Mormonism and of Islam. And you know, so what do these two traditions have in common, Mormons and Muslims, other than they have seven letters and start with an M? Well, first off, American religious history has been really on balance a sort of glorious project of diversity and pluralism. But we have to always remember that it's also a brutal and bloody history too. And when it comes to Americans and America, we really have a talent for demonizing the other. And there really are no two better examples, right, of of two religious minorities in America being slandered, misrepresented, hated, considered enemies of the Republic than Mormons and Muslims at different times, but had very similar persecution histories that we need to maybe remind ourselves. Um, in fact, these two traditions are very American. In fact, Mormonism was one of the very first American-born religions outside of the native traditions. And Islam has been here since before the country's founding. Islam is actually as American as any other of the, tra the Abrahamic traditions. Christianity and, is and Islam and Judaism all were foreign imports into this, into this country. And there are about, interesting enough, about six million Mormons in the continental United States, which is just about the same number of American Muslims, about six million. Um, so today I want to sort of take those two demographics and look at how Islamophobia and anti-Mormonism have played out historically. Um, often they've been conflated, interesting enough, with each other, especially in the 19th century. I want to talk a little bit about the profiles of the founding prophets of the two, tra uh, the true, uh, the, the, the two traditions. And while I wish we had time to talk more about the theological and value convergences between the two, that will have to be um, another time. But it turns out that there is an uncommon affinity between Mormonism and Islam. Uh, and in a way, if we look at the current experience, and very few people know this, that it really is an inspirational example of interreligious cooperation that very few people are aware of. You know, one thing that I've really committed to do while being here, even as an administrator, is to continue to teach. And I've had the really great privilege of being able to teach several classes related to my academic specialties. And, but there's not a, a course that I teach that I enjoy more than a world religions class. And not only because I think everybody in the university ought to take a world religions class, spoken like a true academic who's committed to their, their profession. Um, but I do see a growing and alarming degeneration of religious literacy in our country. Even though the United States is one of the most religious countries in the world, and, it's, and it is the religious, most religious country in the industrialized, uh, economically developed countries, 80% of Americans believe in God, about 75% of Americans believe in some kind of heaven. Yet only about 10% of American teenagers can identify even one of the five major world traditions. Only about 50% of Americans, this is according to a, a recent Pew Research Center study, only about one in two Americans know that the Quran is the holy book of Islam and only in about the same amount of Americans know that, about 50% of Americans know, only know that Joseph Smith uh, was a Mormon. And even less people know that the Dalai Lama was a Buddhist, that the Shabbat starts on Friday rather than Saturday. Why does this matter? Well, it matters because religion is the bedrock of so many people's worldviews. And unless we sort of understand religious faith, it's gonna be very difficult in a way to empathetically and truly understand motivations behind behavior um, of most of the world. 82% of the world identify with some religious tradition. Um, I, I really like Steve uh, Prothero, who's a religion scholar at Boston University, and I think it, it, he has a quote that's, 
that's appropriate here. He said, from time immemorial, and for better or for worse, human beings have been motivated to act politically, economically, and even militarily by their religion. So without making sense of those motivations, we simply cannot make sense of the world. But I really think that there's a deeper reason um, to study other people's faith, whether you're religious or not. And I think it's really summed up by E.M. Forster, the great sort of British novelist, who said this, that most of the trouble in the world is due to our inability to imagine the innerness of other lives. I want you to think about that. Lawrence Kohlberg, who was the sort of celebrated psychologist, actually defined morality, defined morality as the ability to be able to see views and perspectives in ways that are from vantage points other than our own. We have to sort of allow, even if we're not religious, but even if we are religious, to be able to grant the possibility that someone else's spiritual experiences, someone else's answers to prayers, might just be as valid as our own. And only then, I think, that we can come to true cooperation and openness. Religion is important, but we know that religion divides. We know that. But interesting enough that the religion, the term religion, right, the word religion comes from the Latin religio, with that root being lig, the same root from ligament, to bind and to connect. Religion is intended to bind and connect us. Yet so often, it really is the source of division. And many of us and many of those that are religious in nature or not religious in nature don't take the time to sort of understand other uh, religious traditions for a whole range of reasons, whether it's apathy, whether it's fear, whether it's religious conceit of our own tradition, bigotry. There are lots of reasons that we don't take the time, but we should. I had the good fortune of growing up in a family, which I'm very proud that they're here today. Um, I sure love them and appreciate their efforts to, to be here today. But I had the privilege of growing up in a family that, uh, that actually talked about religions and other religions, a great respect for other traditions other than our own. Uh, we grew up, um, I grew up uh, many of my formative years um, outside of the United States. And it was because of those experiences that I, my worldview was shaped in, I think, very privileged ways. Um, but I really think that if we don't have that opportunity to have that kind of exposure to others, beliefs and cultures, then universities ought to be a place in which we can open ourselves up for there, of that. And so I'm very committed to the mission of universities, especially public universities. And so let me start with the, what are some of the convergences of experience that Mormons and Muslims have had especially as it is perceived by the broader American culture. Um, this is not surprising. We know that both Mormons and, and, uh, and Muslims have been sort of, uh, um, um, there, there are lots of sort of unpopular and demeaning representation of Muslims. Uh, Sidney Harris, who was a, a great American journalist for out of Chicago, said the popular caricature of the average Arab is as mythical as the por old portrait of the Jew. He is robed and turbaned, he's sinister and dangerous, engaged mainly in hijacking airplanes and blowing up public buildings. And it seems that the human race cannot discriminate between a tiny minority of persons, he says, who may be objectionable and an ethnic strain from which they spring. So if the Italians have the mafia, all Italians are suspect. If the Jews have financiers, all Jews are part of some strange international conspiracy. If the Arabs have fanatics, all Arabs are violent. In the world today, he closes, more than ever, barriers of this kind must be broken, for we are all more alike than we are different. Jack Shaheen, uh, who is a uh, professor of mass communication, spent a lot of his life trying to humanize um, Arabs and Muslims in the eyes of Americans, but he did a study, Real Bad Arabs, which he looked at a thousand films starting from 1896 to two, the year 2000 of how Muslims and Arabs were portrayed 
in movies. And it's shocking. Of that 1,000 1, movies that had Arabs or Muslims in it, only 12 were positive. Only um, 53 were neutral, and 936 were negative. Now, what he sort of shows is that they're either showed as bandits or they're showed as lecherous, rich sheikhs or their Arab women are sort of shallow belly dancers or images of Arabs having guns or the, the old trope of the Arab and, and the um, bomb vest. But I want to say that, that saying Islam is responsible for terrorism is like saying Christianity is responsible for colonialism. I want you to think about that. Um, so how have Mormons been portrayed during the, you, you know, over sort of American, uh, have, have Mormons been uh, sort of, uh, and they've been dealt a bad hand too. These are actually old uh, um, newspaper portrayals of, of how media and film looked at Mormons, especially in the 19th century. You can see in the, the one on your left here, you can see this sort of creature called Mormonism that is emanating from Salt Lake in Utah, um, that there are also cartoons of where Mormonism perceived as a, as a giant octopus with its, its, you know, its, its tentacles involved in all kinds of things. This one here is, again, an, an old trope of how um, Mormon men would subjugate uh, women in polygamy, and you can see, uh, I think it sort of speaks for itself, but the, the actual sort of Mormon um, perception was that Mormons were sinister. They were lawless. They were a danger to American society. They were conspiratorial. They were sexual deviants. They were demonic, occultist. Um, if you've ever read, by the way, anybody, sort of Arthur Conan Doyle fans here, right? He's the, he's the author of the Sherlock Holmes series. His very first Sherlock Holmes novel was a... Um, um, uh, a novel called uh, A Study in Scarlet. And it was about a young detective named Sherlock Holmes who made his way to Salt Lake City. Um, and it was a bleak portrayal of Mormonism where you know, the story has these forced marriages of, uh, and violence uh, in Salt Lake City. This is just really sort of um, grim perspective of Mormonism. Zane Gray also wrote a book called The Writers of the Purple Sage, same sort of thing. Uh, Mormons were just, um, were, were, were intolerant, systematically terrorizing their neighbors, um, f forcing polygamous marriage on non-Mormon girls, etc. But this was the perception of Americans. And in fact, it was that experience that um, that the federal government essentially um, came out to quell these rascally Mormons. So both religions have been portrayed as exotic and subversive and, and, and foreign. Uh, and, the, and of course, Mormonism and, 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 uh, and, and, and Islam are not the exclusive targets, right? We think about our own uh, religious history in the United States in terms of how Jews were treated, how Catholics Adventists. So the religious minority has kind of taken on the chin no matter who you are. But what's, what you might not know, so that's no surprise, right, that Mormons and Muslims kind of have gotten a, a raw deal when it comes to sort of public media and perception, and we're still dealing with that. You may not know, though, that in the 19th century that both Mormonism and Islam were often conflated. Uh, in in this, uh, uh, this lovely book, um, as early, I mean, anti-Mormon literature started to sort of pop up as early as 1834. But this one here is a, an 1842 uh, book on, uh, which, was, uh, which really likened the, the, the founding uh, prophet of Mormonism, Joseph Smith, likened him to Muhammad, quote, as his master and model. One of, uh, of uh, this one is from the New York Times, um, 
highly important from the Mormon Empire. This was back in 1842. Wonderful progress on Joe Smith, the modern Muhammad, which was often a common pronunciation of Muhammad. Spread of the Mormon faith and new religious revolution at hand. The Whig Review um, in the 1850s, there was a whole uh, series on the Yankee Muhammad, identifying Joseph Smith as, as uh, Muhammad and not in um, complimentary ways, let's just say. Um, in fact, to the creed of the Mormon church, it writes, it will be seen that it is main, in its main features bears considerable resemblance to the propagated Muhammad, the religion propagated by Muhammad. This one here, the, uh, the Mormons or Latter-day Saints with memoirs, the life and death of Joseph Smith, the American Muhammad. Uh, this one here is a, is, a, is a bit of a mouthful. Mormonism exposed in its swindling and licentious abominations, refuted in its principles and in the claims of its head, the modern Muhammad, Joseph Smith, who is proved to have been a deceiver and no prophet of God. That's quite a title. Um, but it wasn't sort of this, uh, you know, it was also sort of popular, sort of, um, this is, um, I don't know if you've, uh, you know, this is, uh, Pac Magazine was a political satire magazine in the, in the mid-1800s. And it was one of the, probably the first uh, successful um, political satire magazine. And this particular issue was dealing with a desperate attempt to solve the Mormon question. And each of these cartoonists decided they're going to take a, a, a stab at this, this sort of pesky question about Mormons. And, of course, you see the, the, the one on the top here, um, this, this sort of octopus-looking guy that's got his, his tentacles around Uncle Sam and about uh, financiers and courts and all this sort of thing. But I wanted to show you this one, which really shows this is a Mormon household that um, sort of, of course, um, we would recognize this as being sort of a stereotype um, Turkish harem. And... Uh, there were some odd sort of thoughts about this tradition. This one here is, is kind of interesting. So what you have here is the Ottoman Sultan. His name is Abd al-Hamid II. And he's poking his head out, and his little servant down here has this thing, says, Joseph F. Smith, who was the president of the church in 1904, which is when this cartoon came out. Joseph F. Smith, president of the Mormons, five wives, 42 children. And... And the sultan is just sort of surprised and stunned that he's not the only one that has plural marriage. So, oh, Allah, there are others. And he's sort of saying, you know. Bruce Kenny has a book called Mormonism, the Islam of America. So I wanted to kind of show you this, because I don't know whether you knew, all right, that, uh, that often these, uh, uh, these things are, were, were there. And it just added to this sort of sensational and exaggerated story about Mormonism. Um, but I really wanted to, to, to show you, what have these two, okay, this is what broad sort of stream, mainstream America has said about those two, two traditions. What have they said about each other? And I think you'd be quite surprised at um, these kinds of statements that come and emanate actually from church leadership. But the question I've been really wrestling with over time is what philosophical foundations do Latter-day Saints have in terms of engaging Islam? And what areas of common concern and values and practice that can create and engender this kind of interdisciplinary, inter interdenominational friendship that can, can create an affirmative gratitude for each other? But I will say that, that, that stereotypes always have a bit of modicum of truth, right? There's always a modicum of truth into it. Into it. And in, and Mormonism has also been susceptible, right, to the prejudice of the broader, the broader culture. But there has been an uncommon sympathy of Mormons to Muslims that I think is may, maybe unique in all of Christendom. The first quote here is as early as 1855. Elder George A. Smith said, it is hard, is a hard matter, as I have said, to get an honest history of any nation or people by their enemies. And if anybody could understand that, uh, Elder Smith could. But he said this, now this man, Muhammad, descended from Abraham and was no doubt raised up by God on purpose to scourge the world of their idolatry. Elder Parley P. Pratt 
wrote, my rational faculties would compel me to admit that the Mohammedan history, right, Islam, and Mohammedan doctrine was a standard raised against the most corrupt and abominable idolatry that ever perverted the earth. And I'm inclined to think upon the whole that they, Muslims, have better morals and better institutions than many Christian nations. And in many localities, there have been high standards of morals. And I think they have exceeded in righteousness and truthfulness of religion, the idolatrous and corrupt church that has borne the name of Christianity. More recently, um, uh, Joseph Fielding Smith said, I believe that Muhammad was an inspired man and the Lord raised him up to do a work he did. And probably the most sort of um, surprising was a first president's statement in 1978 that the great religions of the world, or the great religious leaders of the world, such as Muhammad and Confucius and the reformers, as well as philosophers, including Socrates, Plato, and others, received a portion of God's light. Even Joseph Smith was purported to say that he believed that, this is a quote, that he believed Muhammad was an inspired man and had done a great deal of good, and that he intended to make some to take some of the same course that Muhammad did. That would have been a really difficult statement for anybody to make in the United States in the 1840s. And we'll get into when Joseph Smith established the city of Nauvoo, um, how this bore out in very real ways. So there's that. There's some leadership statements. Um, but what are there some, in terms of Latter-day Saint scripture or Islamic scripture, what sort of foundations are there in which they can build on together? On the left, you have the Quran and the Book of Mormon, and in this case, in the 16th chapter and in the 35th chapter, it says this, we assuredly, we being sort of the royal, royal we of God, sent amongst every people a messenger. And that, in Arabic, that is the term Rasul. Um, and there was never a people without a warner, right? In other words, a messenger, a, a, a prophet, small p, having lived among them. That's not too unlike, in Alma, the Lord doth grant unto all nations of their own nation and tongue to teach his word, yea, in wisdom all that he seeth fit they should have, in their own tongue and in their own way. So what does, often we, have, we hear these sort of stories about how Islam is, is, uh, is so exclusive and no one gets to heaven uh, except through Islam. That's just not how it reads. And of course, there are extremist versions of this, but here's a, in the Quran, the second chapter. I want you to listen very carefully to this. I don't know how, you, how else you explain this, but surely the believers, and they say the believers, the Jews and the Christians and the Sabians, whichever party among these that truly believe in Allah or God, that's what Allah means, is just God, big G, and the last days and do good deeds, shall have the reward with their Lord, and no fear shall come upon them, nor shall they grieve. There's a great story um, by uh, Howard W. Hunter um, in an article that you ought all ought to read if you're or, or, or at all interested, but it's called All All Are Like all are alike unto God. And um, he, he mentions that he had a meeting with an Egyptian cabinet minister that basically said, if a bridge is ever to be built between Christianity and Islam, it must be built by the Mormon church. Elder Hunter also was taking a position, especially in a time when the Israeli, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict was, was waging, that said this, that both Jews and the Arabs are children of our father, they are both children of promise, and as a church, we do not take sides. So there's that. There is foundations in which it can be built. Um, and we're starting to see some really uh, incredible things. And having lived in that part of the world, in terms of, the, of, of what, um, how um, the tradition is looked at from Muslims and vice versa, is, I think it's very encouraging. But with the time I have, I wanted to kind of sh share with you, actually a few, and I, we don't have a lot of time to get, by the way, there's a whole, there's so much here, there, there's a whole course that I've put together on this, but I wanted to show some similarities between the founders of two traditions. And the founding 
prophet of Islam, Muhammad, born in 572 AD, um, was a pious man. Not particularly religious per se, but very spiritual, and in fact, he grew up as an orphan. But he grew up in a time, in a place called, in Mecca, which Mecca was a place of very sort of, um, of vibrant religious conversations. In fact, Mecca was a, a festival city, a pilgrimage city in which 360 idols that were part of the local tribes there, where each tribe would have one day in the city to be able to worship their particular idol. So he was in a, in a, in a, in a very dynamic place religiously. We might remember those that know that Joseph Smith's history of upstate New York in the early 1800s, very similar. A lot of religious fervor, a lot of confusion about, um, about truth. And so both of these men were perplexed about, uh, about sort of um, what is true. They had each had a, a very sort of searching, a, a period of searching internally for truth. But they both had a very similar and profound initial experience. You, those that are familiar with Latter-day Saint history in the Pearl of Great Price and the Joseph Smith history, Joseph Smith writes that, after I had retired to the place where I had previously designed to go, having looked around me and finding myself alone, I kneeled down. And I began to offer up the desires of my heart to God, and I had scarcely done so, when immediately, I was seized upon by some power which entirely overcame me and had such an astonishing influence over me as to bind my tongue that I could not speak. And thick darkness gathered around me, and it seemed to me for a time as if I were doomed to sudden destruction. But exerting all my powers to call upon God to deliver me out of the power of this enemy which had seized upon me, and at the very moment when I was ready to sink into despair and abandon myself to destruction, just at that moment a great alarm, I saw a pillar of light exactly over my head, above the brightness of the sun, which descended gradually until it fell upon me. In 610, right outside of Mecca, Muhammad essentially retreated to a mountain called Mount Hira, where he went to meditate and to ponder. And this was his experience, as related in Raza Aslan's uh, book, No God But God. Quote, he sat, in a, he sat alone in a cave, deep in meditation, but suddenly an invisible presence crushed him in its embrace. He struggled to break free, but could not move. He was overwhelmed by darkness. The pressure in his chest increased until he could no longer breathe. He felt he was dying, and as he surrendered his final breath, light and a terrifying voice washed over him like the break of dawn. And at the moment when he thought he could bear no more, the pressure in his chest stopped, and he heard and felt his first revelation. This was Muhammad's burning bush moment and became what in the Abrahamic tradition is called prophet. Both Joseph and Muhammad received visitations by angelic personages in the first case, the angel Gabriel, and in the case of Joseph Smith, Moroni, and other visitors. But both of them weren't sure that they, what their missions were. There was a period of time in which the heavens did not speak to them. And in fact, it took two years before Muhammad received another set of guidance, and he thought he was going crazy, to the point where he was almost ready to, to kill himself uh, when the angel Gabriel appeared to him and said, Muhammad, you are the prophet of God, you are the prophet of God, and I am Gabriel. As you know, in terms of early church history, there was also a moment, years, between when Joseph Smith would receive additional light and guidance, as they understood gradually, not fully, their role. Both religions and both Joseph Smith and Muhammad saw themselves as great restorers of truth, that they both saw this as restoring a primeval religion and that the original religion sort of represented that of Adam and the prophets. Um, but they founded those religions without being the object of worship. And they're very insistent on this in terms of in Islam that people do not worship Joseph, uh, Muhammad. And 
in Latter-day Saint tradition, Joseph Smith is not worshipped. But there's a very interesting sort of, if you look at how these men received inspiration, for example, in Arabic it's called wahi, inspiration, and it's sort of documented how Muhammad received revelations that ended up being converted later into the Quran, but he would describe this experience where there would be impressions and ideas and even feelings that would come where then he would speak and his followers would scramble around and write down what was being said, which then was converted into um, the Quran later. And if you know anything about how the Doctrine and Covenants was revealed to Joseph Smith, there's very similar. Joseph would receive these impressions, words would, you know, and, and people would sort of write, scribes would write it down. Both, of course, left behind um, authorized books of scripture. Um, and interesting enough that both of these books actually have their own challenges or promises. So in the case of the, the Quran in, uh, uh, in the second chapter, it, it's a challenge that says, and if you, any of you are in doubt concerning that which we reveal to our servant Muhammad, then produce one chapter or one surah of the like thereof, and then call your witnesses. It reminded me of, you might remember Elder Hugh B. Brown's um, famous talk called The Profile of the Prophet, where he said, quote, I ask anyone to take, undertake to write the story of the Book of Mormon, right? the, the ancient inhabitants of America. I challenge you to write it as he did, without any source material. He must check every statement with scripture, he must write 21 chapters on the ministry of Christ and everything the writer claims that Jesus said and did, and every testimony he writes in the book about him must agree absolutely with the New Testament. So I find that these two books come with their own sort of unique promises and their unique challenges. Both, of course, were, um, were persecuted by locals. In the case in 622, Muhammad, as he was struggling with his message and his, even his own role, began to have a small group of followers in Mecca. But this was presented a challenge for Meccan society. One is because it was an economic challenge. What Muhammad was basically saying to the Meccans is these 360 idols that you have, you need to worship one God. You need to raise your consciousness to the God, Allah, right? As opposed to Allah, small g. And that didn't go over well because one, it would sort of undermine the festival economy. <laughs> And uh, that just wasn't popular. That wasn't going to work. And because each of these Meccans had their own sort of ideas of these idols and, and sort of patron gods that they'd have, whether they worshipped the moon or the sun or other types of objects. But this got to be so severe that, mu that Muslims started to be killed. And under the, under the, the, under the night sort of moon of 6, 620 in, uh, in, the, in they call the Hijra, he moved his small band from Mecca to a place called Yathrib, which was a later called Medina, which is 210 miles away from Mecca, so that they could worship and have religious freedom. We know that Mormons, as they migrated to Missouri, that there was so much intensity and persecution that the governor then, in 1838, issued an extermination, extermination order, which was one of the most unique and unprecedented um, policies in American history against another religion, which was an extermination order for Mormons, which said that Mormons must be treated as enemies and exterminated or driven from the state because of their outrageous, and they, those outrages are beyond all description. There was open permits, open license to hunt Mormons in Missouri in the 1800s. And incidentally, that order, that extermination order, wasn't rescinded until 1976. Just saying. I don't know. But here's what's probably more important than anything else in terms of, so, so this is a, a picture of, of being run out of town, out of, out of Mecca. Uh, this is a, a fairly famous painting of those migration out of Missouri uh, trying to find a place to live so that they could worship and heading to Illinois at the time. But here's what's sort of more astounding in terms of that experience between early Mormonism and early Islam. This is a copy of what's called the Dastur al Medina, which is the charter of Medina. So when Muhammad went to Medina, he essentially was 
picked, there were other people living there. In fact, 45% of the people who lived in Yathrib or Medina were non-Muslim Arabs. So there were some Christians, there's some polytheists. 40% were Jews. And only 15% that lived there were Muslims. And yet Muhammad was selected to be not only sort of a religious leader for the Muslims, but also governor of Medina. And he developed the, this constitution of Medina. This is, this is remarkable, but I'm a geek. And that is that the, this was established a multi-religious pluralistic society in Medina. It guaranteed freedom of, of worship. And what's interesting about this particular charter or constitution of Medina is it predates the Magna Carta by six centuries and by our own Declaration of Independence by a thousand, uh, a thousand years. So the idea, this was a, probably the very first written constitution, except I've got my friend Kurt Fitzpatrick, who may say, but wait, what about Aristotle's Constitution of Athens? I have a son who also would probably challenge me on that. That aside, guys, okay? It's important. Okay, but when Joseph Smith ended up trying to carve out a place in which Latter-day Saints could go and worship what he wanted to establish in Nauvoo was 10,000 citizens. And by the way, interesting enough, when Muhammad was in Medina, it was 10,000 people. Nauvoo was 10,000 people. But very specifically, there was a municipal statute that mandated religious plurality, uh, religious liberty, including provisions protecting then the unpopular Roman Catholic Church and Mohammedans. They were welcome in Nauvoo. So, interesting thought about Nauvoo and Medina. Um, before I get into, to, uh, let me say one other thing, um, and we're getting close to time, is actually the succession, there, there was also a succession crisis in both traditions. When Muhammad died, he died with no male heirs, and there was a question of who was going to lead the community after he died. And there were two schools of thought. One was that it ought to be a lineal descent of Muhammad. Yet Muhammad had no male heirs. Um, who should it go to? And his closest male heir was his nephew, um, Ali Abu Talib. And there was a group of Muslims who felt it, the mantle of leadership should fall on Ali. But a larger group felt that, it, that the leader ought to be chosen by consent. Right? That there ought to be some sort of common consent as to that leader. And in this case, there was a group who felt that Abu Bakr, who was the close companion and friend of, of, of Muhammad, ought to be the leader of the Muslims. That split, that succession crisis, had turned into the Sunni-Shia split in Islam. Not too unlike when Joseph Smith was murdered, there was a question of who was going to be the leader of the Latter-day Saint movement. There were those who felt the lineal descent of Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith III should be the, the, the prophet. But there was another group, those that were sort of, um, that were part of the 12 apostles in the first presidency that were close companions and friends of Joseph Smith who felt that leadership should be determined by common consent. And it was through this line of Brigham Young that the church that we, the larger mainstream church that we know is really through that decision of going with Brigham Young. But the lineal descent created the reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or what's now known as the Community of Christ, largely centered still in uh, the Midwest. Well, there are lots of other things that we could focus on in terms of similarities, but no time, especially as it relates to theological and values that, um, whether it's you know, emphasis on the family, uh, whether it's on fasting and dietary laws, whether it's about almsgiving and tithing, whether it's about the similarities between the Hajj and the temple experience. Um, but I also want to make sure that we aren't getting carried away with these, these, these comparisons. Because it do, we can't also diminish the differences. There are differences, and there are sort of very wide differences. But unless we're starting with our similarities, let's start there. And I really am I'm hopeful that, that this is what's kind of going on currently. 
there is uh, there's an amazing and sort of uh, it, it, examples abound, right, of cooperation between the Islamic world and, and Salt Lake. Muslim dignitaries come to Salt Lake all the time in terms of meeting church leadership. Muslims actually use church canning facilities to develop halal food, which is it's a, like, like kosher, right? It's sort of a, um, a ritually clean food. There are lots of agreements between Brigham Young University, right, the, the church-sponsored private university in Provo, with a variety of different governmental organizations and institutions around the world. This particular, in fact, one of the things that I most, uh, um, is that BYU has actually, um, has a BYU, what's called the Islamic Translation Series. And this is where, this is a Christian university that is actually taking, and probably the leading translator of masterworks of Islamic philosophy and, and theology, so that the English word can have, world can have access to these incredible works. Um, I happen to be a part of that, of that project, and what, is that mine? Is that me up there? By the way, um, required reading. Just uh, want you to say. Anyway, um, it's astounding, and Muslims are so appreciative Right, that someone outside of their tradition would be willing to preserve and make ex available these kind of works to the world. And to remember that it was Muslims, though, who kept alive many of the Western works during the Islamic empire. And if they hadn't sort of translated them from Latin or from Aramaic or from Greek to Arabic, they would have been lost. The church does an incredible amount of work, humanitarian work in, in, in Islamic areas. My parents served two Latter-day Saint missions in Amman, Jordan, and they were primarily there as humanitarian servants, uh, which did incredible work with uh, wheelchairs and small businesses and um, so there's a variety of things. But I want to I want to end on something a little more personal. The guy on the left is my great great great-grandfather and my great-great-great-grandmother on the right, George Washington Bradley and Betsy Bradley. They were religious refugees. They had to leave New York, and they wanted to go to a place in which they could worship freely and without harassment, and they decided to join their co-religionists in Illinois. And I grew up with these diaries and these journals. And as they got to Nauvoo, they started, uh, built a whole little homestead and actually managed one of the farms of the church there. And it broke my heart to read of what these family members suffered. It, it got so bad in Nauvoo that they just had to pick up and leave to go to the Great Basin. George left the homestead, to the mobs. And their description of watching their murdered leaders being brought into Nauvoo um, is just really shocking. But the deprivation and the starvation, the sickness that they went through, Betsy and George buried seven of their children before they died in 1871 in San Pete County. But here's the point, George and Betsy weren't lone stories and isolated stories here. There were hundreds of Latter-day Saints who were killed and died from direct violence or brutal conditions that they faced. Refugees from England and Scandinavia, uh, from Holland. But they came to this country to worship freely, like tens of thousands of other journeys. And yet, you know, in a way with all of this hardship and persecution, they prevailed and eventually prospered in communities throughout the West. But here's my point. We are a nation of outcasts and immigrants and refugees. And so we of all people ought to see religious minorities that suffer, that are marginalized, that are misrepresented. Remember their history is our history. And despite Muslims being a part of the American story long since the founding, before the founding, uh, many have felt rejected and fearful in their own country, and most feel so now. FBI data shows that 
violence against Muslims now verges on immediately post 9-11 levels. Harassment, intimidation, discrimination on the ascent. When I would read Grandpa George and, and, and Grandma Betsy's diary in Nauvoo, their question was, what did we do? Why us? We're just trying to live our life. We're trying to live a life of conscience. It's exactly what I read from stories from New Zealand. Uh, worshipers in that that said, what did we do? Why us? Mormons know only too well what it means to be intimidated, to be despised, to be a threat to the, to the republic. And those of us who have ancestors that were victims of cruelty and mistreatment, we of all people should pause, think and empathize with human suffering of those that want greater freedom, religious or otherwise. Surely, surely you know, we are better than this, and surely we can learn from the past. And I want to close with the great Supreme Court Justice Thorogood Marshall and a grandson to, to a slave says this, I wish I could say that racism and prejudice were only distant memories. We must dissent from the indifference. We must dissent from the apathy. We must dissent from the fear and the hatred and the mistrust. We must dissent because America can do better, because America has no choice but to do better. There's wisdom there, and I believe he's right. Thank you. So um, some of you have to leave for class, and uh, we invite you to, to leave whenever you need to leave. We'll have just a few minutes of question and answer. Um, so, Brad, if you want to come on back up, we'll sit up here, and for those that um, would like to stay for the next 15 minutes, we'll just have three or four questions, and um, here we go. That was fun. So, while um, someone's uh, coming up with a question, Brad, I have to comment. There seems to be an indirect correlation between the amount of money we pay for speakers and how many people show up. <laughs> You're still cute. <laughs> All right. Yes, Alan. Like any other sort of, oh, okay, yeah, the, the, Alan was asking that, that there are sort of intimations or even direct words in the Quran, in what's called the chapter of the sword in the Quran about, is there sort of a, um, more of a suggestion or even um, a commandment to destroy those that are non-Muslim? I deal with this all a lot because I think, but like anything else, um, especially even our religious histories, that has to be contextualized in terms of where, what was going on during that period. There was a very specific period during, uh, during the, the period of the Medina period um, where um, there were a series of oaths that were broken and there were then this, this conflict between, between Muslims and non-Muslims there. It, it's, it, it, it's very specific about that conflict in terms of defense. You may have heard of the term jihad, which actually um, is associated with, with violence. And Muhammad actually said there are actually two jihads, and jihad actually means to struggle. 
The great jihad, he would say, is the inner struggle we have with ourselves to be better people, to be more obedient. The lesser jihad is a defensive posture that under certain circumstances and under certain constraints, you can defend yourself with violence. But there is, so, so that has to be understood in terms of a very specific refrain in the Quran that says that when you kill a person, you kill all of humanity. It can't be any clearer in various places about killing non-believers. Now in that particular context, in terms of a defensive posture of being attacked in Medina, we might understand that. And we may understand it because we understand in our, even in the Old Testament, uh, we see a very violent sort of uh, persecution, right, of, 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 of people dying by the hundreds of thousands. So one has to be very contextualized, but it's, it is easy to, to latch on to a particular, a t t t particular idea out of context. And there are some Muslim groups that essentially ride that, that idea as a justification for their political ideas. Could you help me understand the difference between Sunni and Shia? They seem to be fighting, they seem to be fighting each other, the Sunni and Shia. Yeah. That's a, that's a long answer. Basically, what, what started was a, 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 a difference in terms of succession of who ought to lead. Um, and mo a lot of the conflict isn't so religious as it is political. Um, it's a little bit like the conflict in, between Jews and Arabs is really isn't between Judaism and Islam. It really is political. Uh, there are differences theologically. But often they don't, they don't kill each other for that. Um, but take my religion class, and uh, we can we can really dig into that. Um, thanks, Brad. This is an awesome talk. As someone who studied Mormon history and very much agree with your argument, I think it's an awesome call for all of us to be more civic and to be more engaged, especially those of us who share the Mormon faith. Um, I had a question, though, and just the tail off of what was just said, you left out politics. And I mean, that's, I think, the elephant in the room with what's happening now is the political, uh, the political implications. And I think, personally, if you ask me, a lot of Mormons of faith have sold their religion for their party preference. And I think if you had thoughts on that, um, and that's not a popular idea, I know, we're in a red state, but I'm wondering if you have thoughts on the political implications of why this uh, Islamophobia exists when there are very real social, religious, spiritual, historical reasons why that shouldn't exist in a place like Utah, given, the, given Trump and the current political era we're in. Well, you don't really know how to throw a softball. That's an easy one. <laughs> I'm looking at my friend Doug Bennett. Doug, help. <laughs> you know, essentially what is being asked is, is why is there still Islamophobia even among co-religionists that, yeah, <laughs> I don't know if I want to touch that, really. Hey, I only have a few more weeks here, you know, I, uh, I, want, to have, I want to have good relations. Um, maybe some cursory thoughts is, is that, I think that, that I think there is uh, truth that often we attach ourselves to tribes. I mean, we're, we're, we're essentially, a, and whether it's religious or political, we often adopt our, and, then, and, and we don't question even we, we just sort of wholesale accept. There isn't sort of a critical analysis or taking the time to sort of, you know, that, and I would say everybody in here, regardless of your political position, would disagree if you thought about it with platforms of your own political party. If you don't, then I would wonder about how engaged you are as a citizen and how informed you are on, on the issues. So um, I think that there's, this, there's a lot of things that get conflated, right? Um, I think there's a, for example, there's a, a thing called um, American Christian Zionism, which is this attachment and support that Christians feel, and particularly Latter-day Saints feel, towards the state of Israel. And I've written on this before that, um, and, and church leadership has, has taken a position on this, that we do not take sides. And we have to be careful not to, to mistakenly support the state of Israel from spiritual Israel. So the gathering that happened, uh, you know, that, that is being 
foretold in Scripture, um, with the establishment of the state of Israel in, in 1948, I'm telling you, that's not the beginning of the gathering. It's just not how it reads. But we've bought into it, right, with um, Cleon Skousen and other sort of ideologues. Um, I just think that it's a, a complex, people are very busy, they don't have time to sort of sort things out. But it is a, it, 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 I'm troubled too, I think, because I think we do have foundational parallels and convergences with Islam that we don't appreciate or, or understand, and, and, I, and I hope this has had a modest uh, uh, contribution that way. You talked more about the history of uh, suffering and endurance and for both uh, uh, Islamic and, and Mormon people. That aside, and you didn't have time to really talk about the core similarities of traditions, but from your experience and your studies, what is the best gift, without, with prejudice aside, that we could give the Muslim community, and what is the best gift they could give the Mormon community? I don't know if my friends uh, Hussein, Samha, and Khalud and their family are here. Uh, they are a gift. As Muslims in Cedar City, they are great people. And if I think the greatest gift was, was to allow them, to allow us to see their hum, hum, humanness, their humanity, in all of the complexity that we expect that others show to us. Um, I've lived as a religious minority in the Islamic uh, world. I've watched Muslims be in a, a, a religious minority here. And the greatest gift that they would give me as a, as a non-Muslim is, is respect. Um, they had no problem telling me Merry Christmas. They had no problem, and you know, they had no problem honoring sort of my religious tradition. They allowed me to worship freely in Abu Dhabi, you know, and uh, other places. It's, it's, it t it's had a long time in coming, so it hasn't always, religious freedom hasn't always been there, and it's still a work in progress. But I'm telling you that I have, if, of the 12, 13 years that I've lived there, I have never once, never once felt threatened. I never once felt fearful because I was a non-Muslim. They deserve the same. And um, if I can add to that without putting too much of a damper, um, some of our Muslim friends do feel threatened on occasion, even in Cedar City. Um, I've had many of them uh, tell me about their experiences, and so have you. So it would be nice if we could um, go out of our way to make sure that uh, everyone feels our respect, not just silent respect, but um, genuine public respect that could help build the community. I saw a hand way back here. So I'm just curious with the Islamic tradition, the rituals that create community and also the, the rituals that create family connections. If you could share some of uh, your insights from the power of ritual yeah. and how it helps create connections. Let me start from a sort of a, a 30,000 observation um, as it relates to religion generally. I think whatever you think about religion and sort of the negative aspects that religion might create for the individuals, religion has gotten something really right, and that is community. And what we're losing um, is a sense of connection to each other. And that's why we have a high rate of suicide, we have a high rate of anxiety, a high rate of, of depression, because, you know, we were, when, when our ancestors were on the savanna in Africa, we survived not because we were stronger or faster or we had claws or we had scales, but we knew how to band together. And over 200,000 years, we realized that if we were anxious and depressed on the savanna, that means we were alone and that we, um, we were in danger. And with a more isolated world now, with technology and everything, 
we fear fear, fearful and depressed and anxious because we've lost connections with each other. What religion has gotten right is that community, right? That sense of gathering together and being, and, 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 and we, we, just, we just need it. Um, so all of the negative aspects that you may think about religion, they've, they've, they've really gotten right. And I don't think there's been a replacement yet, right? Um, unless you can gather around common interests or something or, or other. But in Islam, they're very good at this, and their family is very important to them. Um, uh, rituals and ceremonies, um, Ramadan, for example, which is a whole month of fasting, is a very sort of, very communal. After, you know, after the sun goes down where they can eat, it's... It's, it's all very sort of public. Um, they're, so they, they have really, there's a, there, there, there's, there's a call to prayer five times a day in the Islamic world. And one of the things that is often commented by Muslims say, you know, we really feel united in the sense that every five times a day, our day is interrupted from the call of prayer, which just raises our consciousness from the mundane to something higher, and that we know that people like us all over the country or whatever, are also thinking about something more than just the mundane. So I think they've got a lot right on that. And I, I, I sometimes worry that as, as maybe the world becomes less religious over time, what sort of trade-offs there are in terms of mental health and security and human wellness that uh, we end up compromising in that. That is a great way to end. Oh, yes, we'll do one more question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> my husband and I just returned uh, from Birmingham, England. Uh, we were on a mission there. And we worked with single young adults, wonderful young people. Um, but we had, a, we had our Fridays uh, free. And we became acquainted with uh, a Muslim group uh, that fed the poor, fed the, the homeless. And we went every Friday night and came to love these people, their goodness. They embraced us. Um, we talked religion. Uh, and, and as you said, so many similarities. Uh, one of the group had taken his family to Mecca and came back, and we were talking about that, that ritual. And they were white. And I said, uh, very similar to us, our sacred buildings, our sacred edifice, uh, we were white there. And they, they were so, um, so gracious. Um, we, we felt very much a part of them. They invited us. We, we went through Ramadan with them. We didn't fast the way they do. That would be very hard. Um, but they invited us to that, uh, the meal at the end of the day. We weren't able to go at that time, but uh, uh, Fridays were always special, and we felt safe, protected. Uh, we came to love uh, these men and the, the women who came. They brought their families sometimes uh, to make sure that their children knew. One of them said, um, our, our purpose in this life is to help those around us. Uh, to be of service to others. And so uh, we learned a great deal from them, and we're very grateful. Thank you for that. And I would submit that anybody who has spent any amount of time in the Islamically oriented country would have the same feeling. Um, the hospitality ethic of Muslims and Arabs and others, it is divine. It is, it is just incredible. Um, so I, th I think that's, that's, uh, that's such a common story, you know. And I often tell people um, that don't, that, that have a hard time, um, I tell them the story. Three years ago, I was um, in Cairo, I was delivering a lecture, um, and I was taking a cab from the airport into Cairo, the American University of Cairo, and it gave me a chance to sort of practice my rusty Arabic, it been a while. So I'm in a conversation with the cab driver, and the cab driver's, um, you know, uh, asking me where I'm from, and I always, you know, play this little game, like, where do, you, where do you think I'm from, you know, 
And uh, anyway, he played this little game. And I said, no, I'm from the United States. He said, oh, okay. And he got silent. So I said, have you ever been to the United States? He said, no, I, uh, man, I'd never go there. I said, why not? He said, listen, everybody takes drugs. Um, everybody has a gun. I would feel unsafe going there. It gave me a chance, right, to say, well, that's not my America, right? That's not my experience. That may, that may be what you see from the news, and, but, but don't let that define what you see. What's interesting is, though, two days before that, with my own American friends, and I was telling them I'm going to Egypt, and I said, have you ever been to Egypt? Never been to Egypt, but I don't want to go to Egypt. Why do you want to go to Egypt? Because I'm an American, and I would be hunted down like a dog. Be, you know. I said, that's not my experience of Egypt. I lived in Egypt. But that is a, a little bit of a microcosm of a conversation that we talk past each other, that we actually see each other with these weird lenses. And with mass media, we only see the most sensational. We only see the most sort of lurid, right? Um, and that is a real injustice to the vast majority of Muslims who are just like the people you talk about, just like Khalud, and just like their family, and just like Hussein, anybody else, it, it's, that's what defines Islam, not the radical fringe that end up becoming <laughs> attached to the larger, larger message. Who in here that is Latter-day Saint hasn't had this experience? You go somewhere outside of Utah, and they say, where are you from? I'm from Utah. Silence. Next word, especially if you're a man, how many wives do you have? I guarantee every one of you had that experience. You go, good heavens. We're in the 20th century. We still think this. Um, this is what Muslims have to deal with. And I'm telling you, it is tiresome for them, I'm sure. Everywhere they go, they better either feel like they've got to defend their faith. That Listen, we're not all like the crazies. Um, but... Um, we ought to understand of any people of, 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 of that, and that's, hopefully that's the message you've taken away today. Well, thank you so much. Hasn't this been great?